Um, good afternoon and uh, good morning. Uh, most of you know, um, my name is Mira Milosevic. I'm the executive director of the Global Forum for Media Development, uh, GFMD. Welcome to this webinar on the principles for effective uh, media assistance co-hosted by GFMD and the Center for International Media Assistance, SEMA. Uh, you have heard uh, Tom has pressed the recording button. Uh, this uh, webinar is one of over 40 events held today as part of the Global Democracy Coalition Forum, a virtual 24-hour event convened on the eve of the Summit for Democracy to be held later this week on 9th and uh, 10th of December. Uh, so we are recording this meeting and it will be posted on the website of the Global Democracy Coalition Forum. Also, the main messages from our speakers and all of you uh, today um, and from all the other webinars happening uh, during the day will be communicated in a joint set of recommendations to the organizers of the summit. We encourage you to visit uh, the Global Democracy Coalition website and attend some of the, the other events that our colleagues are organizing as well. And as well as mobilizing civil society recommendations to the Summit for Democracy, which takes place this week, we hope that this session uh, will be the first of a series of consultations and conversations that will also feed into several processes, including the Global Media Freedom Coalition Conference uh, that will be hosted by Estonia in February, and the process within the uh, GovNet at the OSCD. We will hear more about uh, the MFC from uh, one of our speakers. We have also laid a potential roadmap for this process and the consultations and potential outcomes that we would um, expect to see uh, for developing these principles for effective media development. And uh, we have shared the concept note um, in the message that was uh, circulated to you as the invitation for this webinar. Uh, I think Olga, our colleague, uh, is uh, just posting it in the chat as we speak. So to get going, um, I want to give you a, a long introduction just to uh, reinforce what we've been saying over the last uh, couple of years that it is clear and evidence is uh, abundant that without new public funding and enhanced international support systems for nonprofit media and independent professional journalism um, and uh, other forms of independent media, journalism is in danger of becoming an expensive luxury rather than a universal supported public good. Today, we want to focus not on what to fund and how to fund it, uh, how much funding is needed, but uh, to correct myself, we want to focus on the how. What are the key principles fit for next, next decades that need to be in place to guide the donors and funders in their implementation of commitments made to protect freedom of media and supporting uh, independent journalism? As I said, you can post any questions and suggestions in the chat box and we will try to answer and discuss as many of them as we can during uh, this session. To, to kick start uh, the session off, I would also uh, like to invite uh, my co-host, Nick Benequista, Senior Director of the Center for International Media Assistance, SEMA, to expand on the rationale for this session and on the reason for developing these principles for effective media assistance. Uh, Nick, over to you. Thanks very much, Mira. Uh, good, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, <clears throat> as Mira said, I'm Nick Benequista, Senior Director at the Center for International Media Assistance at the National Endowment for Democracy. And uh, I'm just gonna say a few brief words by way of opening about the rationale for this session uh, and the rationale uh, for the broader effort it represents, uh, which is related to reiterating the fundamental principles that should guide the international collaborative effort to protect, to sustain, and to foster the development of independent media around the world. Now, as you all know, this, this effort encompasses a myriad of activities, 
policy advocacy, training capacity building for journalists, uh, direct support to struggling outlets, the formation of professional associations, self-regulation, reform of public service media, many, many others. And, and these myriad efforts constitute a field of practice and, and international cooperation that we refer to as media development. I think we have an audience today that is very familiar with this. Uh, so why is it important to restate uh, the principles for effective support to media development? What do we achieve by doing this? Uh, I think there are two ways that this uh, may help and two ways that this is important now. So first, the statement of principles is a method of distilling what we have learned. But secondly, and perhaps more importantly, principles can be a tool for promoting uh, greater assistance to the field and for structuring that assistance to the field. And I'd like to talk about the learning aspect first. So this assemblage of practices we call media development, I think we can all recognize has grown much richer and much more diverse. Our field is expanding. We're no longer exporting a single business model, but promoting innovations in business models. The efforts to combat impunity and the killings of journalists have begun to look more fundamentally at justice reform, building institutions to achieve those ends. Uh, we have seen the rise of important networks of journalism, especially in investigative journalism, that have become drivers of media development. And media development efforts are just pushing into new boundaries uh, and out of national boundaries. Uh, internet governance, uh, digital fair, digital advertising markets, these are core concerns uh, that require global collaborative efforts. Uh, and we've seen an expansion of media development into these areas of uh, priority action. So related to this growing richness, media development has matured. Uh, the donors have invested in their strategies. Uh, the Swiss, for instance, have done a great deal of work to try to incorporate media development into the broader governance portfolio. Every major INGO in the field has expanded their research and learning efforts. Uh, we have represented today uh, regional networks, uh, represented by our, our terrific speakers today, who are capable of working both at the global and the local levels. So one main point I'd like to convey is that we're not trying to materialize new principles out of thin air, but to take stock. And given the expansion, the diversity, the learning that has happened in media development in recent years, this strikes us as a good time to take stock and to rearticulate these principles. This has been done before. There was a 2014 report, Accountability and Democratic Governance, published by the OECD with a chapter on principles for media development. But it's been a few years, a lot has changed, and the field has learned quite a lot since then. Still, many of you may be thinking, well, we don't need principles, we just need action. And, you know, indeed we do. You know, the crisis confronting independent news media has deepened. Uh, the starkest examples we have today are, of course, in Burma, Belarus, and Afghanistan, but the foundations of a healthy public sphere are eroding in every continent uh, to some degree or another. And I don't think I need to reiterate that with this crowd. I think we have an audience that already appreciates the urgency and need. Um, so yes, we do need action. And how can principles help with that? Uh, SEMA, as everyone knows, tracks development assistance to independent media. Uh, and that support, unfortunately, has remained a tiny fraction, 0.3% of, of, of official development assistance. We did a series of interviews with donors trying to understand the obstacles to greater support a few years ago, and we found that donors, and especially bilateral, multilateral donors, the official donors, remain nervous about the media sector. It seems political. Uh, they see it, that there's a risk of doing harm, of triggering a small diplomatic row. Distilling these kinds of principles is, a, is an important way of communicating to donor institutions that working on the media sector is possible that there exist evidenced strategies of support, that there are guardrails. So principles are a tool for garnering the political will for action, for support. Now, with that said, we are providing a curtain raiser for an event that we all hope will be a demonstration of 
growing political will to support the media sector. And we'll hear in a moment from a member of the Media Freedom Coalition, which itself is a, 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 another illustration of the growing political will and support that we have, thankfully, these days for our field. And we are grateful, but it's also important to ensure that the action that emanates from this surge of political will remains effective. So urgency should not mean uh, that that support is haphazard or hasty. And we have an opportunity to remind those turning their attention uh, at the Summit for Democracy and elsewhere, and sometimes for the first time to the media sector, that a lot has been learned in our field about how to provide support that is effective. So the panelists today, I hope, you know, the, the, the rationale is to provide some messaging, some that we have lessons worth bearing in mind about the political actors turning their attention to the media sector. And I think what we would propose is that we continue to discuss and reformulate these principles over the coming months as a strategy for ensuring that the lessons we have learned in our, our field do translate into meaningful and effective action. So before we hear from our, our five uh, main speakers uh, on media development and journalism support, uh, we want to first hear from uh, two representatives of donor and international, the, the donor and international community uh, about why they think principles may be helpful and how developing these principles uh, can be done in a way that they are adopted and implemented uh, by international support organizations uh, for the media sector. So we are very pleased to have Justin Williams, Governance Advisor uh, Media on Media Development and Digital at the UK Foreign Commonwealth Development Office, and Guillerme Canela, who is the Chief of the Freedom of Expression and Safety of Journalists section at UNESCO. And I'd like to start with you first, Justin. Uh, as I mentioned, you represent uh, the Media Freedom Coalition. Uh, and if you would, uh, we'd be grateful if you could tell us a little bit about the Media Freedom Coalition uh, and especially the new working group on media development that you've helped to assemble for those who are unfamiliar uh, and why this, uh, the, this coalition and the UK are interested in this conversation around principles. Thanks, Justin. Great, thanks very much, Nick. Um, yeah, so the Media Freedom Coalition uh, is a partnership of countries working together to advocate for media freedom and safety of journalists and to hold to account those who harm journalists for doing their job. It was formed uh, in July 2019 at the Global Conference for Media Freedom in London that year. Um, it's now uh, got 49 countries. The 50th is just in the process of joining. Um, all the members sign a global pledge on media freedom. Um, there's also a consultative network of civil society organizations working on media, um, including a number of media development organizations, actually, some of which may be present today, uh, which are part of the, uh, the consultative network of the Media Freedom Coalition. And that, that helps advise the coalition and um, raise cases of concern. The role of the, or the purpose of the coalition um, to date has been, has been around raising individual cases and situations where journalists and media organizations are under threat, making collective statements um, and supporting members of the coalition and other countries to improve protections uh, for media. Um, to date, it's mostly focused on, on the side of attacks, um, harassment, censorship and so on. But um, this year, we've uh, increasingly been taking account of a range of other wider threats facing the media beyond those beyond those those um, that side of things, including the kind of financial viability challenges and the way that these also combine um, in in kind of sometimes damaging ways. Um, and it's really with that in mind, um, and also with a view to trying to make our collective um, development assistance more effective, um, that the coalition this year has established a working group on media development. Uh, it's met three times and it uh, seeks to improve the effectiveness of, of donors and other support for the media sector. So really the principles work that you're looking at here fits very well into that agenda of that working group. Um, I think it could be really helpful to get common consensus between media organizations themselves, media development organizations and donors on what effective support looks like. 
Um, and just for your information, I mean, we are we are hoping to take some of the results of this process and um, both to bring it to the Media Freedom Coalition Working Group itself, um, potentially to highlight um, perhaps some kind of draft version of the principles if we get there um, by the time of the next global conference on media freedom, which is going to be in Tallinn in Estonia in February. Um, and potentially after that, to, to look to work through the OECD, uh, if we can find sufficient interest among other, other member states of the OECD, also member, member states of the Media Freedom Coalition, um, to try to sort of uh, formalize in a way some kind of principles or possibly recommendation um, around what effective support to the media sector looks like um, through the OECD Development Assistance Committee. Thanks. Thank you, Justin. So this is, uh, I think everyone is going to be keen to understand a bit more about how this working group is uh, interested in ensuring that the collective efforts of donors remain effective. Uh, could you say a bit more about how you would imagine these, these principles being taken up by this collective of donors? And if you are looking to other examples in other adjacent fields of international development for how principles have been used as a tool for strengthening assistance. Yes, I mean, there's a number of different um, principles uh, which have been used by development agencies in recent years. I'm thinking uh, the humanitarian principles, obviously a, a very sort of prime case around do no harm, perhaps a sort of um, most, one of the sort of most highest profile efforts was around aid effectiveness, perhaps in the first decade of this century, um, looking at the Paris Declaration 2005, the Busan Partnership 2011, obviously focused around recipient country ownership and alignment to countries' development strategies. Um, in the governance area, we had efforts around thinking and working politically and, and the Doing Development Differently Manifesto, which was trying to get donors to think, uh, doing, implementing kind of politically smart, locally-led development, which I think was what certainly had an impact um, and then obviously within, within the sort of the OECD itself, there's been a number of different efforts. Uh, I think probably the, the fragile states agenda is one where the OECD has had quite a big impact um, over the last sort of 15 or 20 years. Um, and the most recent iteration of that was a recommendation on the humanitarian development peace nexus. So, you know, there's different uh, kind of levels, um, different kind of, you know, of these sort of principles. And I think one thing, one thing you can say, I mean, although donors' performance in terms of implementing some of these principles has sometimes been perhaps a little bit mixed, I think where they really do help is to sort of um, shape the, the debate around these things um, and to, to establish a sort of common uh, agreement around what, what good looks like, you know, what, what, what does effective support actually look like, even if, even if donors don't necessarily always... Um, live up to that or they some of them do and some don't or some do in part but but it's helpful to sort of to kind of reach a, a sense about what what does effective support look like and and less, i suppose also what less effective support looks like thank you so much uh, justin uh, um, for um, giving us uh, this uh, this overview and uh, um, I'm pleased to say that uh, we are looking forward to um, bringing um, part or the whole document related to these principles to Estonia, to the Global Media Freedom uh, Conference. And uh, from now up to that point, uh, we will be organizing conversations like this and uh, um, different um, uh, ways of talking uh, with uh, GFMD members, but also wider community about what they see as priorities and principles that uh, need to be incorporated with these documents. Um, I would like um, to bring uh, in and now, Guilherme Canella, Chief of the Freedom of Expression and Safety of Journalists uh, section at uh, UNESCO. Guilherme, um, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for joining us from Katowice, the Internet Governance Forum. From UNESCO's uh, point of view, how could articulating these principles dovetail and complement uh, what UNESCO has been uh, doing uh, in this area. And uh, one of the things that I'm especially thinking about is, of course, uh, recent uh, adoption of uh, uh, Windhoek uh, Plus 30 declaration. And uh, um, 
especially the focus of the declaration that's uh, looking to strengthen commitment from member states uh, to journalism as a public good. Thank you, Mira, Nick, uh, a pleasure to be with all of you. Um, I, I think one of the most uh, straightforward connections with these exercises was what Nick was saying in, in his introductory remarks, is the idea of taking stock of what we have done well or what we have done bad and could have done better in the last uh, 30 years. I mean, uh, maybe we could rephrase this as uh, Douglas North has said, we need to understand our path dependence towards this moment. And obviously it's normally very difficult to do historical comparisons, but if we look 30 years back when we were actually approving the first Vinduk declaration, just as uh, on the aftermath of the, of the end of the Cold War or, or some political scientists called the third wave of democracies, at that moment, not only civil society, journalists, media organizations, but also member states uh, were very keen to the idea that we needed to underline the importance of a free, independent and pluralistic media for this process of a new democratic environment. And today it seems quite pretty obvious, but uh, 30 years ago was not that obvious to frame those three keywords, free, independent, and pluralistic media. And this has actually paved the way for very important, and we should celebrate, achievements in this area. We want to stand for enabling the environment for this free, independent, and pluralistic media. We needed to approve freedom of information laws. Well, 30 years later, we have 130 countries with freedom of information laws. In, in 1990, we have only 12. Uh, we have managed to approve a UN global uh, framework for safety of journalists, and this is not a minor issue either. And I, I keep, keep, keep going with those interesting achievements. But we also did some mistakes. For instance, I'm, as you mentioned, I'm calling from uh, you from the Internet Governance Forum. And for many, many years, the media development community was completely disconnected from the Internet Governance community and, and, and vice versa. And we are paying the bill for this mistake because we haven't integrated the challenges of the internet correctly in the discussion of the media development. So, and, and uh, among other achievements that we need to acknowledge, people like Joseph Stiglitz or Amartya Sen, actually during the 90s and the beginning of the 2000s, they did include it in the idea of good governance, good regulation, fighting corruption, the importance of media and freedom of expression, et cetera. So we do need to look back, back on those good and also some mistakes we did. So 30 years later, when we rediscussed the Vinduk process, we added, three new words to this story, to the free and the, the freedom, independence, and pluralism. We added the importance of discuss, discuss the role of the internet companies in, in this game, particularly the importance of their transparency and accountability. We add the word of the, 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 the importance of discussing seriously media viability or the existence of the media sector. And we add the importance of including the citizens in this discussion through empowering them, for instance, via media and information literacy. So we do think here in UNESCO that this is an interesting momentum. And we are, as you said, on the eve of a new democracy summit. And, and maybe we need to flag those things again. And the a big mistake that maybe we did in these last 30 years is to think that we were at the end of history, uh, that uh, press, press freedom was a done deal. It was just a matter of time to get countries uh, more freedom in this area. And we saw that it's not like that. It is a daily job and we need to add and cope with the new complexities of this. So I do think it's good news that the 193 member states of UNESCO by uh, unanimity consensus endorse the principles of the Vinduk plus 30 declaration. This shows something, show that uh, even complex member states are concerned about what's going on. And we should send a strong message to the forthcoming events, not only the Democracy Summit, the Estonia event, as Justin has just mentioned, the next World Press Freedom Day uh, next May. So uh, needless to say, UNESCO is super open to, to be part of this discussion and to see how we can connect. But I, I agree with Nick. I think uh, our job here is how these principles that you are discussing, uh, they, they are learning from what happened in these last 30 years. We have very good news, but we also have some mistakes that we need to acknowledge, mistakes we did it's not others. We need to, to then take, uh, take advantage of these lessons and, and move forward. 
Thank you so much, Guilherme. I think you bring a really important point, especially uh, in relation to uh, what we sometimes take for granted. And those are the freedoms, the rights, and the achievements that we have uh, had over the past 50 years. And taking for granted that these will be incorporated into new uh, digital environment, for instance, into new institutions, new regulations, and uh, uh, new initiatives. And we are seeing uh, at the moment, especially in Europe with the new digital legislation, that it's not that simple incorporating in the, what we um, have as, uh, as media freedom uh, safeguards in other so-called analog laws, they are not uh, easy to uh, incorporate and, uh, and translate into digital legislation. Uh, Nick, did you want to say something uh, before we, no? Okay, uh, so this uh, brings us uh, on to the next section of this webinar, hearing uh, perspectives of uh, some of the leaders uh, in the media development field. And it's a great pleasure uh, uh, to be able to present uh, Zoe Titus, the director of the Namibia Media Trust, uh, uh, whom I am happy to say was elected uh, GFMD uh, chair um, in September in our General Assembly in Tirana, and she will be our chair until um, at least 2025. Then uh, Maria Ristic, uh, regional director of the Balkan Investigative uh, Journalism Network, uh, BIRN. Uh, Suleiman Abrama, uh, the executive director of the West African Media Foundation, and Ayman Mana, the executive director of the Sky Center for Media and Cultural Freedom. I'm uh, coming first to, to you, Ayman, uh, from, and especially uh, uh, interested to hear um, your perspectives from your point as an organization based in Lebanon and working uh, across the Middle East. What are the priorities, would you, um, in your opinion, uh, for the principles of um, uh, effectiveness uh, in the media field? And uh, what do you feel is uh, missing or lacking? Uh, what should we uh, be bringing into this conversation? Thank you very much, Mira. Thank you also uh, to Sima to, to, to invite me. Um, you know, when we talk from a Middle Eastern perspective, we cannot directly jump to issues related to uh, funding principles or program design principles without going back to a sad reality, which is the fact that the Middle East remains one of yeah. the most, if not the most dangerous region in the world for journalists. So this is an area where some of the world's worst jailers of journalists continue to operate freely without any kind of accountability, a place where journalists Free thinkers, artists, publishers uh, get killed in a very frequent way with absolute impunity for uh, killers. So the issue of safety here and the issue of uh, press freedom is so fundamental in the Middle East that whatever principle we, we establish and follow in relation to media freedom, these principles cannot you know, overlook the very dire re reality related to the safety of people who dare to you know, voice some dissent towards regimes in the region that share a commonality, which is their, their absolute disrespect of democratic principles and human rights. And perhaps the fact that only one country out of 22 members of the Arab League are invited to the democracy summit is an indicator. Only Iraq is invited. And it appears to us more as a kind of you know, political, message rather than Iraq being a true democracy, it's ranked 163rd on Reporters Without Borders annual ranking of press freedom. So it, it, it is an indicator of how terrible the situation is in the region. But to go a little bit more directly into the questions you asked, I think one of the most important things when it comes to our region is to realize that local and regional media development organizations have now developed enough expertise, enough knowledge of the ground, knowledge of the political and legal intricacies, enough knowledge of the non-state actors that are also operating in the region, that it is extremely essential that their voice be heard early on during the program design phase, because in a way not doing so is a indication that donors and international partners have themselves have themselves failed 
of uh, after 20 years of engaging with us on a daily basis. No, you have not failed. You have worked with local organizations in Lebanon, in Tunisia, in Iraq, in Morocco that are now credible partners who can engage at the level of program design. And this is actually something good. After 20 years, not taking into account their position early on during the process is a, is a major problem. And I will give you, I'll be giving you two quick examples of projects that seem amazing, but at the same time lack program design engagement. First one is related to a project, a Scandinavian project, let's call it this way, related to the importance of self-regulation in Lebanon, Tunisia, and Morocco. Well, you know, it's Rome is closer to Beirut than Tunis or Rabat. Rabat is closer to Madrid and Paris than it is to Beirut. And so yes, of course, there are things in common in our countries, but just to decide that we have to create um, self-regulation and invest so much money in training, in trips, in hotel rooms to do self-regulation without actually a thorough understanding of the current situation of representative bodies of um, um, journalists is a very strong weakness when it comes to program design. Today, for example, when you look at a situation like Lebanon, where nearly 85% of journalists are outside the official syndicates that are controlled by politicians, how can we talk about self-regulation in the country? Are we talking about self-regulation within each media outlet? Well, no, this was not the design of the program. So trying to kind of force us into a mold and hoping that something good will, will come out of it is, in my opinion, quite naive. Probably, yes, we will learn very good principles, etc. but how to translate this investment into something that will be meaningful for journalists is a major weakness. Another quick example is related to, you know, the need to train journalists and media development organizations and press freedom organizations to advocate for better press freedom in Lebanon, Egypt, and Libya. Again, countries that are even less connected to each other in terms of their uh, situation. This is a major project funded with multi-million uh, UK or uh, British, I mean, with pounds. Um, and three international organizations are implementing it in our three countries with the first one of the organizations asked us for data about press freedom violations another international organization part of that consortium asked us for data about the players advocating for press freedom and a third international organizations asked me for example to be their chief of party for that project based on data we gave them on who the actors are based on data we gave them on press freedom situation, they designed a project where they proposed to train us on monitoring and on advocating, us and other players in the field. It was such an indication of actually something that was designed, funded, and implemented without, before even asking us, with the idea that we will need their support to advocate and monitor. These are very small examples, I understand, and with, with very good uh, print or will, at least the will is, is very nice, but at the same time, an indication that very often programs arrive to our region ready-made with very little understanding of what is happening locally. The second major point I'd like to mention is, is related, and this is, uh, and I, I will not take more time here, is that media development doesn't happen in isolation compared to other uh, programs. Even if all the principles that are listed in the draft that GFMD and SEMA prepared even if everything I just mentioned is taken into account. If on the other hand, the international support for the military, the mm -hmm. international support for justice, for security sector reform, do not respect the principles of democracy, do not respect the principles of human rights, any kind of progress made on the media development side can be annulled if, for example, military aid to countries that are autocratic continues Media will cover military aid to Egypt, military aid to Saudi. Media will cover any kind of um, tolerance towards Iranian proxies um, uh, attack on human rights in order to maintain the negotiations in Vienna happening, much more than whatever progress on the media development side. So yes, it is important to support media development, but it is not happening in isolation compared to all the other policy interventions. If we're Thank here you. to support democracy, we need to support it with a global perspective. Thank you.
Thank you, Ayman. Um, thank you for, for these uh, interventions and uh, for pointing out uh, that uh, demand-driven approach is something uh, that uh, we increasingly uh, need to look at uh, when we talk about uh, doing development differently. Um, now moving to you, Maria. Um, in your experience as an organization that is a publisher, but at the same time uh, working with other outlets uh, in the region and many other things, what is uh, uh, your priority in terms of uh, recommending what principles are needed for uh, effective media development? And also, what are uh, specific principles that donors need to look at when funding media organizations as opposed to civil society organizations? Thank you, uh, Mira, and, and really thanks to, to your team and SEMA for uh, organizing this. I apologize in advance if my connection is bad. I'm in a hotel, so <laughs> it may happen. Uh, that... It's excellent. Okay, good, good to hear. So as you mentioned, um, I'm a running uh, Sarajevo-based organization, but we work uh, as a network in the southeastern uh, Europe, as, as many of you know, uh, that is an area where we had a lot of media intervention, at least two or three decades of trying to help uh, media sector uh, to be more sustainable uh, and uh, it sometimes it even looks that we're still at the beginning. Uh, so I will be uh, in a way quite critical all of us but also of, of the whole concept of the media intervention so far and I think uh, there we often uh, focus on consequences and not on the causes of uh, the issue or the cause or the key problems. And uh, referring especially to the Balkan experience, we've seen quite a lot, especially in the last few years, um, a lot of attention to the business and sustainability model, how to make Balkan media more sustainable uh, and to have more money and not to be dependent on donors. But then uh, few donors uh, or only rare donors actually want to look into the causes of the issue and how to fix the market because all of us exist in one market. And in order to earn some money outside of the donor community, you actually need to compete on the market. And it's quite difficult to compete on the market when we have issues around ownership structures, advertising, now even more tech companies that it's extremely uh, difficult on a global level uh, to regulate and not to mention in this small region where uh, we don't have uh, people who even communicate from Google and Facebook uh, with us. So in that sense, it, it's not enough uh, to give uh, uh, money to uh, develop a perfect business model on paper, if then after uh, the donor leaves, we cannot attract um, uh, advertising or someone can buy that media outlet, etc. And I think we saw that in Serbia uh, quite a few years ago, uh, and now we are seeing that in Hungary. And few weeks ago, we saw that in Ukraine uh, as well. So there is quite a pattern, I would say, in, in uh, the semi-authoritarian state, how to actually uh, capture the media that were once sustainable. Hello? Uh, sorry? Uh, do you hear me, yeah? Yes, we can. We, we uh, oh, okay. get someone uh, short, turn yeah. on their, their, their mic by, by mistake. Good. Uh, so then in that sense, really, my recommendation would be that the goals need to be carefully measured or realistic, and that we also need to take into account this bigger context where media uh, operates and to cre create actually some kind of enabling environment for media to be sustainable. I'm not really against sustainability. That's also our uh, goal, but we also really need to be uh, careful and, and realistic. And then uh, related to that really is um, what are our goals and uh, what, are, what do we want to achieve also as media organization, but also as donors? Do we have long-term goals or do we have short-term goals? And then if we have long-term goals, in terms of helping the organization that produces news to develop, then obviously we have to have long-term strategic projects, partnerships that last for many years. And I think Bian also had that 
uh, and is having still with few donors and it's like great change comparing to where we were five or 10 uh, years ago. But it's also okay to have short-term projects, but then these short-term projects need to have short-term goals. Like, do we want to create, for example, high quality journalism, or do we want to create uh, skills training or something like that? But then we cannot say that we, with the trainings, we want to fix the market because these two things are, cannot be necessarily connected or lead to each other. Uh, and also, I think Ayman mentioned a lot of that, but we also need to contextualize our goals. Uh, and I know that from my own experience, because uh, uh, impact, for example, uh, in journalism in Albania and Bosnia, it's not the same. Even we are part of the same region, often it's quite different context that we operate in. And the same project cannot be equally successful in these uh, two countries. And uh, my last point, because I want also us to have time for a discussion, um, is a lessons we got from COVID uh, is flexibility. Uh, that when we design project, we also have to be uh, flexible and be able to adapt to the situation and this fast changing uh, environment. Because something we designed three years ago, unfortunately, will not lead to the same results uh, today or will not lead to the results we hoped uh, that it will lead three years ago. So it's, it shouldn't be complicated uh, to actually uh, change uh, the focuses, to change the themes, if we actually have a, a good justification uh, for creating uh, maybe bigger and, and better impact. So yeah, here I would end Mira, and if there are more questions, happy, happy to answer. Thanks, Maria. That was that was terrific. So we've heard from Iman uh, talk about the importance of uh, more consultative approaches to program and project design with regional and local organizations, and uh, the importance as a principle of aligning media development support with uh, broader support for the political environment in a given country. Maria has talked about the importance of focusing on the, the root causes and the root challenges of media, including on issues of sustainability, uh, on setting goals that are contextualized, uh, and on providing flexible support uh, for the long term. Sulemana, uh, I'd like to turn to you. This is Sulemana Brahma, the Executive Director of the Media Foundation for West Africa. Uh, what, what would you add or like to reinforce on the importance, uh, on the principles that will be important to keep in mind going forward? Thanks, Sulemana. Well, um, thank you, Nick. Um, thanks to Sima and JFMD for the invitation and, of course, for the wonderful conversation. I think I would essentially say that, of course, over the years, we've always received support. And any form of support contributes to a certain goal and therefore is important. But I think what is critical is to ask ourselves what type of support, what kind of support, and what is the nature of support that tend to make the impact that we would want to see and also lead us to seeing value for money. Because at the end of the day, we are asking for more money, but not just for more money, but also thinking about how do we then invest the money in ways that will give us value for money and also make the impact. And I think where we can draw um, the greater part of our lessons from is what are we learning as we implement programs and projects over the years? And I would say that for the last 10 to 12 years that I have been in this field, if there is a particular principle that I would want to advocate for in terms of what works, what brings about change, what gives value for money, I would say that we should be looking at support that is long-term, support that is flexible, support that is equitable, and equitable I'm talking about north-south divide, support that is demand-driven and beneficiary-led. And if I may uh, uh, just add, I would say that these kinds of support, if they are framed this way, needs to be focused not on instrumentalizing the media in terms of how do we use the media for a course 
but focused on how do we develop the media so that the media itself becomes a pillar and a driver for development and democracy. Now, to just try and break down some of the um, principles or some of the sub principles that I was mentioning in terms of long term, we have had occasions where most of the time, sometimes six months grants, eight months grants, one year grants. And by the time the paperwork and all of that is done and you set up a project, three months is already gone. So you have barely nine months or eight months to implement. And that either pushes you into the mode of trying to tick the boxes or trying to get the activities done and report that the activities have been done. So short-term support certainly um, has not been helpful. Then of course, we've had occasions where you would have three years, four year projects funded, but without flexibility. So you have predefined what the situation should be in the next four years, defined your objectives, you know, the activities that you are going to implement in order to achieve those objectives. And you are going to be stuck by that. So where there is no flexibility, you have no room to even think through and amend structures and make sure that the contextual, uh, prevailing context is being uh, responded to appropriately and so on and so forth. So that's to talk about the, the terms for grants and the question about flexibility. Talking about equity, we've had, I mean, those of us in the global South, you have situations where, you know, you start a partnership arrangement for a 2 million or 3 million grant. And at the end of the day, it's about 200,000 coming to you to deliver the intervention and to, to a large extent, maybe it's a grant that is for, you know, uh, media development in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so the equity, you know, and the power relations is something that um, we need to uh, also talk about. And then, of course, I think Eman and the other colleagues have talked about the need for programs or funding to be demand-driven rather than supply-driven. So we have the money, we know what the problems are, we know what the challenges are. Here is $2 million, $3 million to do A, B, C, D. And if we are calling for proposals, we have already defined what we want you to deal with, what we want you to tackle, rather than allowing for the people on the ground, the organizations on the ground that know the issues to say, look, we have tried this, it didn't work. We tried that, it didn't work. We think this is what would work and therefore the resources must be channeled this way. And finally, the issue about beneficiary driven and beneficiary led. Quite often, those of us implementers think we know it better than the people who are affected. But in reality, they know what affects them and how best they can deal with it. And finally, that is the only way when you leave, you leave some capacity behind. Because at the end of the day, no donor will work with a community or a country forever. And you would want to build local capacity so that when there is exit of funding, the locals are able to continue with whatever um, capacity that um, have been built for them. And then the point about instrumentalization, as I keep saying, when we talk about even the little support that already comes to the media, it's more about media for climate change, media, media for anti-malaria, media for health, rather than how do we build the media itself as an institution to be able to play the watchdog role and the development roles that they have to play. So yes, the term limit, so in terms of longevity, long-term, flexible, equitable, demand-driven, and beneficiary-led um, approaches is what I would suggest. Thanks, Salamana. That is that's fabulous. Uh, Long-term, flexible, equitable, demand-driven, beneficiary-driven support. Thanks for that. Uh, Zoe Titus, uh, turning to you now, the director of the Namibia Media Trust and newly elected chair of the of the GFMD. Uh, would you like to add, uh, Zoe, any additional principles? Uh, I'd also like to give you the opportunity to talk a bit about how you see these issues, the issues that have been raised already, how they how they're interrelated. Go ahead, Zoe. Um, thank you, Nick, and thank you for this invitation. It's lovely to be with you today. Um, I mean, I think it's it's, it's very clear um, to me what the linkages are. Eamon um, emphasized the need for participation and ownership um, in the design of programs. Um, I'm in complete agreement. Um, I mean, we cannot 
um, promote a, a cut and paste approach, uh, a cut and paste approach to media development. An important principle, therefore, be and as already articulated. Um, is that local needs, cultures, the size and the level of development of the market are factors that should be taken into consideration. Maria um, emphasized um, the need for long-term strategic partnerships uh, with funders. Again, I'm in full agreement. Um, and here I would add the, the words um, flexibility and relevance. And this takes us back to what Eamon proposed, the emphasis on local needs. Um, when it comes to larger uh, development funders, uh, bilateral agreements, uh, I mean, we all have the experience of working with GIZ, the EU, where um, the just the development and, 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 and consensus on the content for call for proposals takes several years. And by the time that those proposals are launched and awarded, the issues may no longer be relevant. So um, again, um, emphasis on the need for relevance and flexibility. Um, Suleimane um, emphasized the age old dilemma, I think, um, that we in the media development sector have faced, um, and that is the, the seemingly parallel issues of media development and media for development. Um, for, for, as, for as long as, as, as there is an acknowledgement that the media is a sector with its own development needs, legitimate needs, I might add, that are central to the enjoyment and strengthening of democracy, um, or in the words of the GFMD, and I quote, uh, as a primary pillar for social, economic, and political progress, um, then we are not making any progress uh, in, in, in our efforts. Um, now, in retrospect, and uh, I don't think that we've even touched on this issue of journalism education, because it's part of the, the media development framework. This is a pet peeve of, of mine. Um, um, this one of um, conflating journalism education as part of marketing public relations uh, within journalism training curricula. Uh, maybe that's the first misstep um, and possibly, well, possibly a discussion for another time. Um, but to go a bit further, Nick, if you'd allow me, um, and thanks here to uh, Guilherme for initially making that connection between media democracy and media support, um, because that brings me to the issue of uh, democracy and go good governance and how that is measured. Um, I think that there is not sufficient emphasis on media freedom, freedom of expression, and how that is articulated and measured um, with the existing good co governance indicators that are available. Um, and the, the one that comes to mind is the African peer review mechanism, uh, which, for example, in its own definition is designed to collectively and collaboratively uh, address socioeconomic um, problems, improve governance practices, and strengthen laws and policies. Um, but it in itself makes a very cursory reference to media freedom and none whatsoever to government's responsibility to promote a free, independent and pluralistic press. So I think there's some work for us in this instance. And again, um, it would not be a matter of going back to the drawing board because at least uh, in the African context, we have the revised Declaration of Principles and Freedom of Expression and access to information to fall back on as a powerful mechanism to advance this particular agenda. Um, I've done a lot of talking, but this is another particular issue that I want to raise because I think it's such a splendid opportunity that has not at all been considered and here I'm speaking again in the African context and and this is the opportunity that is being afforded by the signing of the Africa free trade agreement um, it came into force in 2019 I think April 2019 and trading actually started on the 1st of January this year but um, you may ask so how is this relevant to this discussion it all comes down to the issue of convergence 
the coming together of telecommunications infrastructure and content provision due to technological convergence and particularly the internet. So right from the start, the African Union identified trade in communication services as one of its five key priority areas for the implementation of this agreement. And I think, I mean, this, this is a global um, you know, imperative to advance trade for um, uh, for poverty alleviation, etc. Et so, but as governments push uh, or scramble to take advantage of the trade possibilities, they will be forced, at least in this context, to turn away from dilapidated media policies and laws, and will be forced to harness the modernizing force of the internet, and that would have to include traditional media. And that means policy reform. So if there is a focused agenda on policy reform, there's an opportunity for us to influence that policy. Um, so in this case, um, for that to happen, the media sector has to be supported for Africa to realize the, the advancement that its governments seek to implement. So that means no internet shutdowns. It would have to mean no internet shutdowns because um, if governments throttle the internet for fear of negative publicity um, during elections, during um, protests, business industries, um, and all economic activity based on electronic communications grind to a halt. So for us, those of us in the media development sector, those concerned with media freedom, freedom of expression, access to information, and freedom of the internet. Um, this presents a huge opportunity to use this global economic shift to the fourth industrial revolution um, to garner important uh, national, regional, and global gains, um, I think, in, in media policy and regulation in general. Thank you, Zoe, for, for excellent, uh, excellent uh, points. And uh, thanks uh, to all our speakers uh, for, for these uh, uh, insightful contributions. Um, I would like to comment on, on many things, but uh, just to go back to um, uh, Guilherme and also from to Guy Berger from UNESCO. Guilherme had a couple more comments and uh, Guy had uh, a question in a comment in the chat that I think is also very relevant related to data. So before we go to other questions and other participants for, for your comments and uh, suggestions and questions to our speakers, back to you, Guilherme, for your comment. Oh, very quickly, very interesting. I, I, I really uh, um, support Solomon's point that sometimes uh, the discussion about media development and the support for media is related to some specific goal, like uh, supporting the health system through media or whatever it is. Um, but I, I also think there is relevance in, in speaking with the donors from that part uh, of, the, of the pot of the money. Uh, because international courts, they, they have uh, underline this double uh, element of freedom of expression uh, as a right in itself, but as an enabler of other rights. If we look into this uh, forthcoming democracy summit, the three key points, democracy and authoritarianism, fighting corruption and protecting human rights, I mean, I do think we, you guys, that we're going to send some recommendations for these people, you need to stress that uh, freedom of expression and press freedom uh, is relevant for everything of those three axes. And this is not necessarily relevant for uh, necessarily true for other rights. So uh, sometimes we are not discussing with the rule of rule of law departments of the donors or the fighting against corruption department and those different pots they should be looking in the importance of enabling the media environment for 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 those different actions that are also relevant for for protecting democracies etc so uh, we need to be stronger in that thing the the, 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 the the combat uh, and i finish with this the combat for instance regarding money laundry has gone a lot of weight after panama papers pandora papers Papers, et cetera, with this kind of investigative journalism work, but this hasn't was not possible if we if we don't have a strong media environment or freedom of information laws or whistleblowers protection, et cetera, everything that is connected with a, with a freer media environment. 
Thank you so much for that comment, Guilherme. I think it's also relevant for what Zoe uh, was saying around uh, international finance institutions and uh, you know African Development Bank, uh, European Development, and other development banks, and how they invest uh, in development of different and loans as well, uh, and how they fight corruption uh, without often uh, considering the role of uh, of media and the media freedom uh, for for that uh, transparency access to information and anti-corruption efforts. Uh, there is also uh, an important uh, role for private sector. And Guy, if you don't need to leave immediately, I was just coming to you to just give us a, 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 your comment from the chat. No, Guy is, uh, Guy is gone. But his comment was related also to, to data sharing. And uh, there is um, a, a project that um, UNESCO is implementing at the moment together with one IFRA. So there is this also relationship with, uh, uh, with the private sector, uh, both in the media field, but in, in technology field. And Guglielmi is at the moment at the Internet Governance Forum, where we have uh, uh, two years ago managed to launch a dynamic coalition on news and uh, journalism sustainability, opening the space actually for these principles to be channeled into into those conversations around uh, you know freedom of uh, of media online, freedom of internet, and access to information online. But um, to open the floor uh, to your questions and comments. Uh, please do your, raise your hand or just uh, let us know through the chat that you have a question uh, to discuss. Uh, one of the comments was from our colleague Sasha Muter from uh, Foundation Irondel. Uh, I think he uh, asked uh, uh, one question, but with, with several layers, uh, and it was about what is the, the fora, what is the process that will be uh, interesting for us to take these principles to? Uh, and Justin responded, but uh, would you like to elaborate, Sasha, a bit your thinking? Because this is one of the, of the layers that's worth thinking about and links to Zoe's and Guilherme's comments as well. Thanks, Mira. I think you captured my question very well. Uh, do you uh, want to, to expand on that? And uh, why do you think that uh, it's important to take this uh, beyond the MFC? And uh, you know, what, what do you think uh, will be important to achieve also at the OECD level? Yeah, right. So um, again, uh, we, we think the, that first, thank you very much for the initiative. I think it is very well elaborated and the proposal you suggested is uh, takes on the major issues. Uh, again, our main concern was that it's good, it's very important to target uh, the main donors, of course, and the OECD is a good uh, starting point for that. But since the obstacles are also political, it would be good, good to go beyond those actors. But I think uh, I just in uh, answering my question also in the chat, uh, namely that there are more uh, countries uh, that are now part of this uh, go uh, media government's working group. Um, and then the next step, again, I don't know whether it should be through uh, UN, UN, UNESCO, Guillermo can talk about, about that, I guess, IPDC or the Special Report on Freedom of Expression, the African Bank uh, for Development. I think there are other bodies that could be interested in this type of topic and we should surely liaise with them at some point. That's it. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Sasha. Um, so please do raise your hand. I mean, we, we've uh, organized this as a, as a round table. So uh, I know it takes a minute for people to muster some courage, but uh, raise your hand or share a comment if you'd like to jump in. I, I think it is interesting that we've, we've picked up on a, a question that has arisen as we've discussed these principles of where to draw the line around these principles. And it does relate to this distinction between media development and media for development. Uh, and, you know, I think I'd be interested to hear the, the panelists come back on this topic. We, we do think, and I agree with Guillerme, that, you know, of course, the amount of support going directly to media development for the sake of developing the media sector remains very small, while the amount of support going to things like communication for development is, is enormous. And in any health or uh, poverty alleviation project, there is likely to be increasingly some engagement with the media sector. You know, so one way of addressing that issue is perhaps in these principles to start to formulate, to draw from existing guidelines to do no harm. So should these principles engage with a, a series of some do no harm principles, 
that encourage uh, folks investing in engagement with the media instrumentally uh, to ensure that they're not compromising the independence of the media sector, that they're not doing damage to the sustainability of the media sector, and perhaps even, and I know they, we don't want mission creep, but taking advantages of some missed opportunities. There's a lot of international aid spent on advertising, for instance, uh, that is uh, not necessarily directed to the benefit of independent news outlets uh, in, in those countries. Uh, so there are some missed opportunities as well as opportunities, I think, to implement some do no harm principles. But do the panelists, uh, in terms of engaging uh, both with effective principles for media support, for media development, and for media for development. Are there any remarks on that uh, besides Sodomana's provocation? Ayman? Zoe? Only on one point, I'm definitely agreeing with Sulaimana and, and this distinction between media development, media for development. One point related to um, I don't know if they will put it inside media for development, but more on the strategic communication side. There are also um, uh, instances where political developments in donor countries are so important that they push their governments to actually show that they are acting on the issue. I mean, there are two very clear examples. Around 2013, 14, 15, at the height of you know terrorist attack in Europe and when ISIS was controlling large parts of the territory in Syria and um, Iraq, but also the, the, the role of Boko Haram in Nigeria and elsewhere, the, the investment that was made in the field of preventing, countering, preventing and countering violent extremism and the impact it has had on funding going to actual media work was a major issue of uh, dilemma for a lot of media development organizations and media organizations in the South. Should they tap into this money, which was actually enormous, it was like drinking from the fire hose at one point, or actually focus more on their key belief, which is that high quality journalism that gives a voice to everyone is a way to engaging the society, is a way to uh, you know, breaking from the culture of disenfranchisement that might actually lead to radicalization. And this kind of the same applies today with the issue of disinformation and misinformation. We do understand the impact of misinformation on the US election, on the Dutch, on the German, on the French election, on Brexit. But does it mean that everybody and their cousins need now to only focus on mis and disinformation with programs related to, yes, let's organize media and information literacy classes in schools without any kind of real work related to impact, related to reach, to understand whether the kind of ready-made, um, um, you know, strategies to address mis and disinformation work in our context. I can give a clear example, sorry, from UNDP or from a latest, uh, one of the latest French development agency, bids. It's not even a call for proposal. They released enormous amounts of money as tenders, as in, this is the terms of reference, this is what we would like you to implement and come up with the least expensive offer. It's difficult to think that this can work. So whenever UNDP comes to us and say, please develop some leaflets that we can distribute in schools against mis and disinformation, just the mere fact that they think this will work is a problem. And why are you pushing us to, um, and others, I mean, in all the other countries, to uh, actually mobilize our resources, our teams, our best talents to actually develop leaflets instead of engaging deep inside with the population, with the media to understand how to address it, instead of actually helping us develop a stronger, you know, bargaining chip with the social media companies, so on and so forth. So these are uh, some additional points that I would wanted to uh, throw in the discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Thanks very much. Zoe, I see your hand is up. Go ahead. Like very, very briefly. Um, I mean, we, we've had a lot of discussion about media support and media development, but I think we, we often forget that there, we are not speaking about all media. It's important to have a very broad based, you know, approach or understanding of media, but what we are wanting to support and wanting to sustain as independent public news media 
an emphasis must be placed on that. So um, when it comes to, I mean, when, I mean, we're speaking about direct support to, to, to independent public uh, interest media, then um, I think uh, there are many uh, models to, to, to consider, but importantly, there must be some reinvigoration of the market because, I mean, the business model that, I mean, um, comes down to a market failure. So a stimulation of the market is important because Nick, you mentioned something that is very important, I, I think, um, to pick up um, the fact that, uh, and this goes back to uh, something that, that Sulemana had emphasized, um, that there is uh, a lot there there are a lot of funds to be spent by development agencies and one of the ways in which to do that is to um, use advertising spend um, in uh, encourage these agencies to 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 use advertising spend and 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 to pay for honest advertising in independent media uh, i mean it seems like a very silly th thing and very basic but it goes towards stimulating uh, the market and this um, encourages agencies uh, then to think twice about the the media that they engage in and, and, and having a better understanding of the local media market um, that's what i wanted to say um, just in in a nutshell thank you and Nick, if I can just uh, um, call on um, our participants uh, to um, give us their ideas uh, about which principles from the previous recommendations or existing declarations we should uh, uh, keep or expand on, or which principles we maybe didn't mention in the conversation today. So please uh, raise your hand um, uh, virtually or physically. Uh, and uh, and go ahead share with us your your ideas um, around this. No, I don't think that. I can see Guillermo raising his hand again. So oh, very quickly, just to yes, be, while people are thinking to to comment on what Sasha has mentioned. Uh, I, I think, Sasha, you are right, and maybe one of the principles, Nick and Mira, should be, although it seems obvious, that we, UNESCO, IPDC, the Special Rapporteur, we should also improve our own coordination on those issues. I mean, and, and uh, sometimes we just need to state the obvious, no? Uh, but I think it's it's a point, although we are trying, we, we could do better, and particularly this coordination between the UN system, uh, UNESCO-like agencies to the regional, I mean, uh, inter-American system, African Union, I think we can benefit a lot if we improve this, this coordination mechanism is in these areas. So just to support what he was suggesting and could be one of the elements of your own document. That's a very good point, and this is uh, exactly why we are doing it today in the context of Summit for Democracy, uh, even though we are also preparing these principles for other processes and for us to connect all the different uh, um, initiatives and uh, to bring all the uh, relevant players together so that we can uh, we can have a united action on this. Um, uh, Suleiman has uh, his uh, hand up. Yeah, um, Mira, just uh, um, uh, two points quickly. Um, the first is to re-echo some of the comments that have already been made. Um, so 2020, the world is struck by COVID and, and suddenly there is money all over um, to the media to say, well, the media should do public education, public awareness, combat misinformation, and all of that. And the question to ask is, what media do they think exists for them to use these monies to, to work? And so that for me is a fundamental question to say, well, it's important to build a certain media that is ready to work, who knows when the next pandemic will be, so that we don't have money available for the media, but no media available to do that critical work. Now, I think in terms of the principles, it may be useful to also look at the role of the big technology companies, um, the Googles and the Facebook and all of that. I think last year or the year uh, before, we, we, we all read about the initiative in Australia uh, on how to support the local media ecosystem. And I think that the media in Sub-Saharan Africa is even more impacted because uh, in as much as we all know that yes, advertising and the revenues are all going online, 
There is no capacity to be able to, first of all, uh, do what is needed to be able to generate the online revenue. And secondly, the little that's re generated, about 90 or more percent of that is going to all these big tech companies. Unfortunately, whenever um, something is rolled out from these tech companies to say, okay, Google News Initiative or Facebook Initiative, Media Initiative, or whatever it is, it is still crafted in such a way that at the end of the day, it's to benefit these tech companies. Um, in Africa, I doubt there is any individual country that will have the way without and the economic power to be able to stand these tech companies like Australia did. But perhaps in blocks, if, if the AU, for example, decides that, well, this is a common negotiation that we are going to make for African countries and African media, I don't think that the tech companies can say, well, to hell with all African countries. Or even at the ECOWAS level or SADC level, when the 300 million population in ECOWAS, ECOWAS decides, look, we are going to engage with Google or Facebook to demand that local media is supported this way or that way, I don't think that they can say to hell with all the 300 million people. But if Ghana with these 30 million poor people decides to do that, I think we can easily be ignored. So maybe we have to have a principle around the role of the tech companies uh, and how they can support you know, quality journalism um, around the world, but particularly in these areas where companies don't have the capacity to engage and yet everything is going to these tech companies. Yes, before I go to Nick, just to comment on that, to Nick uh, Suleiman, excellent points. And uh, also in the context of the Summit for Democracy, uh, there needs to be also this reflection that all these big companies are based, most of them in the US, but in some other uh, developed countries around the world. And the governments also have uh, this opportunity to call upon them to implement both due diligence, risk assessment, and to be uh, accountable and fully transparent when working in countries uh, uh, that have less leverage and power to negotiate them with them directly. Thank you for that. Um, back to you, Nick. Great. I see we have uh, two hands raised, Leon and uh, Brigitte. Um, if you please go ahead and make your remarks, and then we'll start wrapping up. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the point that Sulemana raised is very important. And um, one of the things we tend to neglect is that many of the spending on development is based on uh, country-based strategies to develop uh, countries. However, the challenges, especially the market challenges, are currently global challenges. And so, although I uh, subscribe to all the principles that were formulated in the previous discussion, I think there is a space for global programming, uh, potentially and preferably unified uh, global programming to influence the way in which markets are currently shaped. To a certain extent, the OECD countries are addicted to the belief in a liberal uh, let's say the a liberal economic uh, democracy model that is no longer valid in the face of the global monopolization of information resources that is uh, currently privatized and corporation shaped uh, by the tech platforms. So we need a kind of unified global response to that, preferably in my view by uh, global programming for uh, policy, because in the end of the day, um, um, we, we cannot live by the current market principles whereby, for example, a newspaper sees a public broadcaster as its principal rival, where in fact, both of them are being marginalized by the dominance of, um, of non-ethical non information that is uh, going viral disturbing democracies and populations. And, and, and so I think there is a space for global programming. I don't know how to formulate this in a principle, but I think the um, one of the remarks that I think is missing from here is that the, the media development strategies based on a, on a, on a country-based strategy only go that far. And especially on the governance level, they don't cut um, they don't cut what is needed to develop democracy anymore. Thanks, Leon. <laughs> Go ahead. Is it Bridget or Brigitte? 
Apologies for the mispronunciation. Everything works. I call myself Begid. Um, thank you very much. And uh, I, it's been a really exciting discussion. And uh, I love uh, to have this set of uh, principles uh, defined. I adhere to and agree with, and based on my uh, uh, concrete experience, uh, know uh, how important uh, most of them are. Um, here, I just wanted to add one point uh, that hasn't been mentioned, but just uh, coming among others from Community Media Forum Europe, uh, saying that where, where Zoe, or was it you, Mira, talking about the independent uh, public interest and news media being at the focus, I would say that for a democratic media environment, uh, community media, um, citizen media should not be forgotten, uh, just so that it's mentioned and that we keep it in mind when we develop the, the refined frameworks around the principles. Thank you. Great. Maria, did you uh, like to make some final comments? Yes, just, just briefly because um, we are anyway speaking about um, Summit for Democracy. Uh, and I think we, we saw this trend in, in Southeast and Central Europe that often uh, media development assistant became, assistance became a political issue. So often a lot of uh, donors don't want to engage in uh, media development funding because it's a complex political issues in countries. So in a way, I think it's also important for us to say that supporting media should not be a political process. We need to support media because we need free media as a society and not because some government likes that or, or doesn't like that. So, so that's only for me quite, quite short. Thanks, Maria. Um, and I'd like to just make a couple of final remarks too before turning it over to Mira for closing. Um, I'd actually like to revise my opening statement. So initially I had said that the rationale for this was uh, a, a statement of principles is an opportunity for learning. Uh, a statement of principles is an opportunity to uh, to get the political will that we need for greater support for the media sector, and 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 that the principles are important now as political will surges um, to ensure that we are you know engaging uh, in a way to ensure that political will translates into effective, meaningful action on the ground. But through the course of the conversation, I've realized that, that this exercise in stating principles is, uh, is a method of organizing among ourselves. You know, I hear emerging here an agenda uh, among civil society organizations, regional, local actors, international actors, a real agenda emerging uh, for our own engagement. Um, and so I'd like to add that as a, a sort of a, a fourth rationale for continuing this conversation on the principles I, it's just been a joy to have this conversation. And I think it's, we're surfacing absolutely fundamental issues in the process. Um, you know, I won't reiterate, I think, the, the great points that we've uh, heard today. Uh, we'll do our best to sort of synthesize those into a, a recommendations document, uh, as Amira will explain. But uh, just to say that this isn't the, the end of it. So we, I think it's important to continue this conversation There'll be more opportunities for consultation. We'll continue to revise these. Uh, we won't get it right uh, today, but, uh, but I think that many of the points that have been raised here are absolutely fundamental. And I've come away with it with a, a, a much clearer sense in my own case uh, for where to invest my energies. So I just wanted to thank everybody for the conversation today. It's been, it's been terrific. Mira? Thank you, Nick, and that's uh, um, my my sentiment as well. And I agree with all the points you you're making. We uh, felt this kind of uh, collective commitment and energy uh, two years ago when we were drafting uh, an emergency appeal for support to to journalism and media uh, when uh, COVID started, and all the our colleagues and members and uh, their uh, partners around the world uh, were facing a tremendous set of difficulties. And uh, those, uh, uh, those recommendations that we had in, in that uh, uh, emergency call for support uh, were actually something that brought
brought us here to, to think about these principles because there was so much there that we wanted to say and so much there that, that needed to be communicated both to you know, donors, uh, governments, media companies in uh, our community as well. So uh, uh, next steps for us, uh, based on your excellent uh, uh, contributions and comments is uh, to create uh, a report uh, from this meeting incorporate that into uh, the documents that we have started uh, developing. Uh, Olga and Tom have shared link to those documents and uh, you can comment either uh, by um, joining uh, the Google Doc and then making comments. You, you can also download it and uh, do it uh, as a word format and send it back to us, whatever works for you. Uh, there is also a survey after you close your Zoom window that you can uh, fill in. If you would like also to be part of uh, uh, maybe smaller group conversations and uh, co-designing these principles uh, with us. We will be also working with uh, several of you to help us uh, design uh, uh, the language around these. Uh, and we hope to have a first draft of uh, principles uh, for comments uh, in, uh, in January. Uh, I, I would like to thank you again for joining us today and uh, would like to invite us to give us uh, any comments and suggestions uh, that, uh, uh, that you might have.